the space with which, you know, the area through which we access the pericardium. And it's, of course, his name, he's a very famous French physician and surgeon. He was, he was in Napoleon's Grand Army. And um, he is, of course, a father of triage and was a widely respected uh, uh, physician. And he was a credit, he's credited to being the first one who created uh, ambulances. So during a battle, he would actually take uh, his little wagon and go pick up soldiers. And irrespective of class of distinction, he would, of course, treat the people who can be treated. So um, his writings are very fascinating. So um, those of you who are interested in history should look it up. So how do you put Larry space in context of anatomy? So here's a series of uh, uh, data. This is in a paper that my colleague, um, our anatomy fellow at UCLA, Dr. Shumpe Mori, is putting together. And I'm going to be showing you data from his and other papers that we put together. This is a reconstruction for you. When you're looking at a patient, this gives you the chest wall anatomy and what lies beneath. So the reconstruction in the front actually shows you all what I mentioned to you before, which is the lungs. And the fact that the right lung covers a little bit more of the heart and the left lung actually has a small area because of how the lobes embryologically develop that you can see a little bit more of the heart over there. And most of the right ventricle is retrosternal. And this is the xiphoid process you see over here, the xiphoid process. And these are all the chest wall muscles over here. And in the left side, the muscles have been removed and this is a reconstruction, which took days to do. You can actually see the bony reconstruction. So this is a, for the first time, we are demonstrating this to the world. And, um, and this information is, uh, very useful for uh, for navigating uh, the heart and the two things that you need to know is there's a lot that is written on the literature about the anterior versus the posterior approach to the pericardial space and uh, over here i'd like to sort of bring your attention to uh, irrespective of which area that you take for accessing the heart whether an inferior or a anterior stick. Uh, inferior is uh, you sort of slip underneath and try to avoid most of the RV. And the other stick, of course, is the anterior stick where you image the body in a lateral uh, plane. No matter which approach you use, the first part of the heart that you actually go through is the chest wall. And this, I'm gonna pause for a second because I really would like the audience and the group to appreciate this a little bit. One of the dangers of the pericardial axis, among the numerous dangers that we have, the problem starts literally underneath the skin. And why, do, why am I saying that? These are all the problem vessels that you deal with. So uh, this is a reconstruction um, which, uh, you know, Shumpe has done with, with a lot of effort. And what you see over here is the overlay. So these are the vessels that you are, uh, sometimes no matter what you do, there is a finite risk of getting this. And if you are somewhat careless, uh, and if you uh, don't pay attention to anatomy very carefully about the, your point of entry, you could damage um, uh, some of these vessels, especially uh, uh, the vessels. And there are reports, uh, as many of you know, of internal thoracic uh, artery injury. So the problem begins there. And if you look at the left part of the screen, then comes the whole three-dimensional dive, if you will, where you have to sort of avoid the liver to get into the space. So it doesn't matter whether you do anterior or inferior, <laughs> there's a lot of problems between the tip of your needle and your destination, which is the pericardial space. So, um, and what about the pericardial space? It's a problematic space because it's a potential space. And, and, and really this is an autopsy specimen where you know the, already the heart has shriveled up a little bit. Normally these two layers are touching each other. So that adds to your challenge of getting there. Um, here are two reconstructions that we put in. And this is again, this is, uh, I'd like to recognize Shimpe Mori again. Um, and, and in this presentation, what you're seeing here is, uh, the you know the the movies and hopefully i'll get this to play in a second 
these are two layers um, of the pericardium, the parietal and the visceral layers. And the purpose of this animation is to give you an appreciation of what lies beneath. And when you go from the tip of your needle, uh, and if you can sort of in your mind, think of all the structures that you're gonna be crossing through, that has been demonstrated in this, uh, uh, in this animation. So I'll play this again for the benefit of the audience, which is right here. So that is, uh, you know, for you to know where it is. And in this example, we've also sort of uh, shaded where pericardial catheters are generally positioned. Uh, this is from, a, a, from an actual patient who had a VT ablation. Uh, we did this full reconstruction. I'll probably pause here for a second to see if there are any questions at this point. Uh, Nishan, do you, uh, are there any questions at this point? Because uh, I wanted to make sure that I uh, paused for a second to uh, answer any quick questions at this stage. Yeah, that's probably a good spot. Um, I haven't received anything in the um, chat. Oh, here's one. Okay, if you could talk about surface landmarks in terms of access, um, and then I guess just because there are a lot of fellows on, uh, how do you advise your fellows when they're taking on these epicardial procedures when they're done? You know, uh, do you tell them that they should be sent to a major center? Should you, do you tell them that go ahead, you've done enough during training. How do you have them approach it? So, sorry, I, I was muted, my mistake. Uh, okay. So there are, two, there are two very good questions. One is, you know, the immediate question, which I can answer based on this lecture. The second question is a question that involves both anatomy, judgment, your practice environment, and ultimately, you know, what, what qualifies for independent flight, right? So uh, my, I'll start off with a tougher question, which is the second one. Uh, always when you start in a new place, it goes without saying, we say this to all our fellows, choose your cases carefully. If you have senior colleagues, talk to them, discuss with them. If they are not physically at the location where you practice, call your program directors, call the people who trained you, call other colleagues and briefly run the case by them because they can give you perspective. There are certain aspects of how to do a procedure which I did not have the time to do today because I wanted to make sure that I communicated key anatomical concepts. Always make sure that the patient doesn't have, you know, coagulation issues, liver enlargement, make sure they don't have the interposition of the colon between, look at the chest x-ray. So there is a little bit of a pre-flight checklist of how to. And Nishant, since you're the director of this course, if you do such a session, we'll bring up some of those questions and you know what is not in the literature. Be careful to make sure that you know there isn't effectus. Last week, I think this was in JC or somewhere, there is a very nice paper that shows some people actually have very long xiphoid processes. Therefore, you may actually have a longer path to go into the chest wall. So I think it's about case selection. So the second question which was asked is it's case selection and being careful and looking at all the, you know, even the uncommon things you should be in your checklist as you, you know, get the history and examine the patient. The first question was, you know, what are the landmarks? Perhaps the most important landmark is the xiphoid process and try to avoid going very close to the costal margins. And when you access it, try to stay a little bit behind the sternum and then learn to dive in. And that component of landmarks and how you feel and do this is what I'm sure your program directors and others are literally holding your hands and teaching you. So moving on to the next part of this uh, slide, you've seen this 3D recon. So let me take you to a kind of a real world case. This is a uh, paper that was published by Jason Bradfield several years ago. And in this case, we actually put a uh, uh, a alligator clip onto the needle. And we are actually showing you the track of uh, epicardial axis. This is a CT reconstructed, the heart sitting over the diaphragm, as you can see. And now when you overlay, we did an electronatomic map of the RV endocardium seen over here. Uh, 
by the way, this was the pre-Twitter world. <laughs> so this would have been a very beautiful tweetable image. But what you see over here is the needle. The needle is now vis visible in the electron atomic mapping system. Look here, in, in real world practice, uh, you may not have the liberty and the luxury to do this, but if you plan your procedure well, you could actually see this. And the purpose of this is, this is a overlay of the electron atomic map onto the CT. Now, in during a case, you can actually literally see this. And the purpose of this procedure is that when you get the needle closer and closer to the pericardial space, especially there's adhesions and so forth, you can always use this as a guide to say, oh my God, I don't want the tip of this needle to ever get near this uh, electron atomic voltage map. Does that make sense? So if you've gone there, it means you've gone too far. So that is uh, kind of how that is done. And this is really showing you the 3D dial angle of how you go over the liver and get into the pericardial space. Now, having with this piece of information, I'm gonna show you a video of, if you're visibly looking at a needle as it's sticking the pericardium, this is how it's gonna look. So I let this play, video play and I'll play it a second time. What you see over here is a near field view of a needle perforating the pericardium and entering the pericardial space, all right? And you'll actually see this, this is the wire. So I'll pause this for a minute and play this again uh, for the benefit of the group. And just before it plays, let me explain to you what you're gonna be seeing. On the left lower corner of the screen, you're gonna see the tip of the 2E needle, the curved little tip. It's gonna be coming in to the left lower corner of the screen. The beating surface of the heart that you're seeing this, which actually has tiny little pericardial arteries and veins, you'll actually see that. The needle is gonna actually puncture the pericardium and then a J-tip wire is being threaded in the pericardium. And once the wire is in it, look as if it's like, you know, it's like sort of uh, like a little worm, it's wriggling into the pericardial space. And at that time, the 2E needle is being withdrawn back and you'll just see the wire sticking out of the pericardium, okay? All right, I'll roll it here for you. Needle is coming in, do you see that? That's the needle. We just took the pericardium, wire going into the pericardial space. Needle coming back, and that's the wire sticking out of the pericardium. And once more, for the benefit of the whole group, And that's the wire, all right. So now let's make a few comments about mapping and ablation so that I'll stay on time. So once you're in the pericardial space, there are some important concepts for you to know. Uh, there is almost virtually no region of the heart that is on the outside of the heart that cannot be accessed using epicardial mapping. And uh, the, there are anterior axes. Once you're in the space, you can go in front of the great vessels, map all of the tricuspid annulus, all of the RV relevant for tomorrow's lecture. And then, of course, if you go through the oblique sinus, so there are two sinuses that in, in the back of the heart. One is called the oblique sinus, another is called the transfer sinus. And people get very confused about these structures. And I'm going to use this opportunity to give you and introduce you to how to look at 3D anatomy of the heart. So if you look at the heart and remove the chest wall and cut the parietal uh, layer of the pericardium, these are the vessels you see, aorta, right atrial appendage, you already saw that the PA. And if you cut the heart out, and if you look at the cut edges of the pericardium, this is how it looks. You know, this is the inferior cable vein, the superior cable vein, aorta, PA. And these are the four pulmonary veins. Um, and th this is the cut edge of the pericardium. Do you see that? These are actually the cut edges of the pericardium. So the part of the pericardium that is, goes behind the great vessels over here, 
is called the transverse sinus. And the part of the heart that is behind the LB and the LA is called the oblique sinus. So this is a very confusing term. How do you, how do you make sense of this? And this is a very important reconstruction. It took you know, days to make. The way you should look at the pericardial space is shown in the left panel over here. And this is a paper that's uh, um, being submitted. You'll actually see that it's almost like a fist going through a balloon, which is shown in the left upper panel. This is the embryologic heart that is developing, which has a arterial pole and a venous pole. And when the heart develops, as you know, it's a tube and then it folds on itself. And when it folds on itself, it has a venous pole, which actually has, you know, the cable veins and the pulmonary veins. And then it has an arterial pole, which is uh, the pulmonary artery and the aorta, right? So when these structures fold on themselves, that's how the sinuses form. So the transverse sinus is shown here. You can see this. And essentially what the heart, uh, uh, the way the pericardium does is, the pericardium actually has two little holes, uh, or orifices almost. So the arterial pole is here, and this is the venous pole. So this becomes, you know, this, is, this literally is the hilum of the heart. And all the mediastinal nerves and the structures that enter the heart actually have to use this uh, you know, arrangement. Because in, within the pericardial space, there are no nerves, there's no structure that connects the parietal from the visceral layer of the pericardium. It's actually smooth, right? That's why fluid can float around it. So if you see any kind of connections there, it means it's an adhesion. So that's an important concept to keep in mind. And we don't have time to go over this in great detail, but you'll be reading this in the paper this is very important. So the heart, the pericardial space is almost like a glove that encases the heart. And it has, you know, the two fingers for the glove. The fingers are where the vessels uh, go into the heart, which is uh, the veins and the arteries that bring blood out of the heart. So that's an important concept to keep in mind. And that is what, when you see in dissections, you can actually see, and this is another beautiful McAlpine dissection, where if you open the heart and if you look at the, take the heart out of the chest and look at the reflections, you can see the oblique sinus and the transverse sinus of the pericardium. All right? So that is, the, again, in the right lower corner, what you see is the cut edges of the pericardium. Now, one of the ways we visualize this, of course, in the EP lab, the oblique sinus, which is the part behind the heart, here is a epicardial ablation. We put a uh, pigtail catheter in this case. It goes all the way behind the heart. It's in the oblique sinus at the very top. This catheter is in the RVOT. You can see that. And this catheter goes from the IVC to the SVC. So it gives you the orientation. Now, this oblique sinus is this part, like if you do a standard parasternal 2D echo, the region of the heart that you see behind the uh, uh, left atrium you see where the arrow is pointing to the echo image, that is oblique sinus. So if you're assisting a cardiac surgeon in the OR, it's the part of the heart where you put your hand underneath the heart. So that is uh, you know, the uh, orientation for you to you know, tell you where the sinus is located. Another way to look at sinuses is something that very recently was published by uh, Dr. Mori. And Shumpei did a very interesting reconstruction of a patient who had a pericardial effusion and then he asked a simple question, okay, why don't we get rid of the heart and look at the 3D structure that is left behind? That essentially becomes a case, a casing of the pericardial space. And that for the first time, you can see that the, in this case, the pericardial fluid has gone into the recesses. Now, several years ago, we thought, aha, so if we can use this, why don't we actually try to visualize this by Taking a patient, this is a patient who had a VT ablation, and after the VT ablation, we took the patient to the CT scanner, and the patient needed a CT scan. And at that time, we put contrast into the pericardial space, and we obtained a, a image, and we have done a 3D reconstruction of the pericardial space alone. So this is a kind of the first of its kind image. And what you see over here is the arterial pole, which is where the PA and the aorta come out. And here are the pulmonary veins. And this little area that you see over here is the transverse sinus. Do you see that? 
That is a contrast that is going through that area. So this is oblique sinus, transverse sinus, seen in a patient. Um, this patient had a BT ablation, did well. And you can actually see the shock lead, which is in the RA and the RB. But that's just, and it serves as a good orientation for you to tell you where, you know, so that is an image of all you see is the ICD lead and you don't see any uh, heart tissue at all. You're only looking at the pericardial space. So I'll read this rule for a minute so that you can see the, you know, the arterial and venal poles of the heart. This is the PA. Um, this is the superior and inferior cable vein. And you can see this is pulmonary veins, the aorta. And when you take away these structures, what is left behind is the 3D pericardial space. All right? So that is the living anatomy of the pericardial sinuses view. Now, uh, I'll also uh, show this to you as a 3D recon so that you can fully appreciate how the two layers of the pericardium interact. And this animation is to show you uh, that finding. And we are getting close to the end of the hour. So uh, it's the exact same heart so that, you know, all the, you know, our colleagues who are on the phone, you know, will have the orientation. And this, by the way, is the pericardial drain you see over here, catheter. So um, the double layer reconstruction, what I showed you was the two layers. The visceral layer is the layer right over the heart. The parietal layer is the layer that covers. And if you go one step below, remove the cardiac, the heart out of this image, what I just showed you, you can actually see the transverse sinus that is running behind the great vessels, all right? And uh, again, Imagine and in, in your mind, look at the pericardial space as a three-dimensional space, and that will immediately tell you how to navigate yourself around in the pericardial space. And uh, so this is a, uh, we don't have time to do this. We'll save this for the next talk where we look on case selection and how you do anterior versus inferior axis. And I'll just make a quick closing comment on all the pericardiac structures, which are important for epicardial mapping, and that is the phrenic nerve and the esophagus, all of which you can protect, uh, and the lungs too, which you can protect carefully by shielding catheters. And one of the structures that requires a lot of care, of course, are the coronary arteries. And of course, if you inject contrast, we always, each lab is very different. Uh, our group is very compulsive. We always do coronary arteriography before applying energy in the pericardial space, because that's very important because you don't want to damage coronaries. And uh, there are very important insights that you get from epicardial mapping, whether it's a pathway or VT, the information that you get from that surface actually helps you guide ablation. And uh, there are specific locations such as the pyramidal space near the base of the heart, where there are important nuances to epicardial mapping, and that is uh, the extent of pericardial fat and the presence of veins and arteries, and more on this during future VT ablation courses. And also how, uh, you know, there are times when you have to do multiple accesses, especially when you have complex uh, postreceptal uh, pathway. And again, postreceptal, you should catch me and say, aha, you caught me with a bad term. So this would be uh, pathways that are close to the crux of the heart. So these are areas where you'll be hearing more in future anatomy sessions. Phrenic nerve is a big problem in during catheter ablation. Here's an example of a VT that is very close to the phrenic. You can see diaphragmatic capture. And how do you prevent this? You can place a balloon in the pericardial space, inflate it so that you physically separate the catheter from the phrenic nerve and you can safely ablate. And this was you know, many years ago, my colleague uh, uh, Eric Bush published this. And, um, you know, this is now standard practice in many labs around the world. Uh, several groups, Dr. Stevenson's group, Dr. Marchalinsky's group, and Dr. Natali's group have all published on this. Sometimes they inject, uh, uh, in addition to placing a balloon, they also inject uh, fluid and air into the pericardium to sort of separate the phrenic nerve away. So um, that's uh, phrenic protection. 
And I'll uh, leave you with one thought, uh, a future paper that's coming out on this subject, we are gonna actually upload stereolithographic files for all our colleagues around the world. So anyone who has access to a 3D printer can actually print the model of this heart and literally put these structures together um, and you can actually use that in your, uh, uh, for your own learning because you actually have to hold that in your hand to see how these spaces work. So um, I'll stop here right on time.